This is the Ag Engineering Podcast that rolls right into the details on tools, tips, and techniques that improve you, your farm, and our world. I'm your host, Andy Chamberlain from the University of Vermont Extension, and this podcast is sponsored by Northeast SARE. Thanks for listening. Today's episode comes to you from Moncton, Vermont, where we visit with Stephen Park of Full Belly Farm. He and his wife, Sarah, established their farm in 2017 and have about 110 acres. They grow strawberries, blueberries, and vegetables and gross about 400000 in sales, both in on-farm retail and wholesale markets. They're farming in the climate zone 5A. Mulching strawberries is a key component to the production system. In this episode, Stephen goes into the details on how he mulches the strawberries on his farm. In order to be as sustainable as possible, reduce labor, all that good stuff. Let's jump right into it. And so kind of back on the topic of of mulch, we can uh, kind of go through that process and some of the things we've learned and some of the challenges and stuff with with, uh, straw mulch. So like I said, it's it's really important for the um, protection of the plant in the winter. And so we, but you want to wait. So we wait until the plants go dormant. You definitely don't want to get the straw in too early when the plants are still growing. It's really um, um, damaging to the plants if you block all that light out while they're still trying to grow. So you have to wait till the temperatures are getting cold enough, which, you know, I, I, it's, I don't know exactly what to tell you. I, I you know, like I, I basically wait until we've had a number of nights getting down into the 20s. Um, and then I try to get out in the mornings, um, trying to prevent like ruts and stuff in the field. If it's wet at all, I like to kind of get out on really cold mornings Do it when it's frozen when it's frozen. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it takes me a lot more days because as soon as the sun's coming out and it's softening up that ground, it's like, well, I'll wait till next tomorrow morning to keep going. Cause I don't, I don't want to tear the field up. So yeah, it tends to be the end of November or early December. So when we first started here, we were using um, a large square bales of wheat straw that was coming out of, uh, of uh, Canada. And we had a, a mulch uh, chopper, a, a Teagle bale shredder, um, a 40-40 um, with an extension on it for, for the large square bales. And that's what the previous farmer here had been using uh, we had a lot of problems with that um, that bale shredder was not really designed for holding a thousand pound bale that way and we had a lot of breakdowns in the first year the next year we decided to try to find round bales that actually that, that thing was really designed for that that bale shredder is really designed for round bales <clears throat> so we did find local round bales the next year uh, the next year we had tractor problems mid spreading and my wife and I ended up finishing two acres of mulching with round bales by hand which <laughs> in the snow which was not a lot of fun but uh and then our third season we kind of started getting things figured out so we're um uh we replaced that Teagle bale shredder with a, another the same brand uh just a size up so it's the 50 50 model and it holds a five foot round bale rather than just the four foot and we were buying what we could find locally, um, which, so one of the challenges with, with straw, like you, you really don't want any seed in that straw at all because you spend the whole season trying to prevent weeds and, and, and do good weed management and cultivating and everything. And then, uh, like we found our first year, you know, we, we had this nice weed free field at the end of the season. Then we spread straw all over it. And the next spring we had wheat, (laughs) you know, mats of wheat growing up all through our whole field because there was, even with a good combine, like there's going to be some seed left in that straw. And if you're not using herbicides, you know, a lot of people will, can, will just do like a pre-emergent herbicide before they sprout, but we weren't doing that. So, so then we were hand weeding in the spring. Yeah, hand weeding <laughs> wheat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, so we did find somebody locally who had some like uh, uh, what we call pre-cut straw. It is a rye straw that's grown and cut... Um, at like just like just before milk stage, like when the, the seed is not viable, but you still get nice uh, nice amount of like biomass and a lot, a lot of straw from it. So so it's actually cut before going to seed and not combined for seed, um, and that worked great. Um, that was a lot better. We had a lot better results with that. 
Um, but for a few years, there was a lot of like trying to figure out where to get it every year. The prices would vary from one place to another and quality and, um, and trying to source it every year. It was always a stress because it's such an important um, input. You know, one of the most important inputs on the farm for us. It's very expensive. Uh, we, we do, see, last year we spread about 120 round bales and at 70 bucks a bale, you know, that's, that's an expensive input. Um, so we actually planted rye last year on some of the extra acreage we have that, that isn't our, like, better vegetable acreage. It's more like our heavier clay fields. And I planted about 35 acres of rye last year for that. And then um, I, uh, I bought a hay bine and did the cutting myself and then had a local farmer do the baling, raking and baling for me. And so now this year we are going to be using our own mulch that we grew on the farm, which is real exciting. And we know the quality. We have plenty of it. And I wouldn't say it saved us a whole lot of money. Ultimately, <laughs> maybe it's a little cheaper. But after all of the, the tillage and everything and the, the hiring out the baling, and I think we could we can make improvements on that in the future. But but even even if it doesn't save us a dime, which it does save us some money, but even if it didn't, it's we have the quality and the quantity when we need it, and and that that um, is you know that's done. We that's done in June. We have it here. <laughs> we don't have to think about that for the rest of the summer. You know, no, um, when normally would you be trying to source that? Um, I mean, kind of all summer. You know, I'd be calling around and. And, you know, one year this person might have some, but then they don't the next year. Yeah. And, and this person's might be $80 a bale and this might be 60 over here. And, but, but you don't know the quality, you know, it was, it was really challenging to find pre-cut straw consistently. Typically we were still buying stuff that had been combined and we're still dealing with that up until now. So, which, um, which means it was also shipped hundreds of miles i mean well some of that was local find, did you yeah yeah local rye straw that was that people had combined um but yeah all the stuff from canada was um very expensive and i know the price has only gone up on that when we in 2017 we bought in a truckload of about 45 of the large square bales and they were a hundred dollars a piece um I've seen them now. They're they're twice that price now. They, in just a few years, they're they're two hundred dollars a piece. Um, so you know, that's nine thousand dollars of straw to <laughs> go spread on the field. You know, uh, yeah, it really adds up. So getting control of that process and that system and, and quality control and all of that's been been really important. And we're kind of we're getting there now. We are. There's still a lot of challenges with growing the straw ourselves because. Um, you know, now we have, we have 35 acres that we're planting in rye and cutting off in June. And you don't replant that until um, September. And so now you have a few months there of ground that, what do you do with? You know, you're trying to keep the weeds from getting out of control and we're running over it with harrows and, you know, trying to keep it clean and there's a lot of tillage. Um, so I'm trying to find a system. And also you're just taking from it every year, you know, um, and not really putting anything back. So we're going to start working towards uh, developing a no-till system where we can always have something growing. Uh, what I have in mind, and this is unproven at this point, but <laughs> what I have in mind is like a, a frost seeding red clover um, before cutting the rye and then we'll have a quick stand there and then maybe um, um, no-tilling in like a sorghum sedan to really aggressively block out the weeds all summer and then flail mow that really low early September and no-till rye into that. That's it's kind of a, a thought that I have right now that I'm working towards, but um, I haven't done it yet. So. Yeah, we'll yeah, there's yeah. a lot There's a lot to happen to see if that actually works or not. Yeah, yeah. What challenges that may face, too, because then you might be, you know, you mentioned Sudan grass. If that grows a ton, trying to incorporate that biomass and then still no-till drill in planting might might be a challenge I yeah don't know. <laughs> i think i think with the flail mowing we have a large flail mower yeah. that we can get over the field pretty quickly with and that that i think would chop it up enough that we could we could till in or plant into it with a no-till those so. those planters seem to be pretty impressive mm -hmm. learning more and more about them myself so what's it take to 
shred these round bales and, and get them onto the field. You said it can take several days because you're trying to do it early in the morning and, and you don't necessarily want to be out there with uh, floodlights mm-hmm. <laughs> at three in the morning. Yeah. So um, how long of a process does that take? Is it a one-man band show or do you have a crew to help you do that? Most years so far when I've actually done all the spreading with the tractor, um, it's been by myself or sometimes, uh, we, we had a, a skid steer for loading bales. My wife would sometimes be running the skid steer to, to be loading bales while I'm, um, shredding. And so, but I'm now using a, a tractor loader instead of the skid steer. But, um, so I'm, I'm running, um, the bale shredder using a hundred horse, uh, new Holland. And I like that bale shredder cause I can run a thousand RPM PTO for that bale shredder, which is great. It, it speeds it up a lot. And then somebody else is loading those bales, or sometimes I'm doing it myself, getting on and off two different tractors, but uh, loading those bales in the field. So they're driving, picking up a bale while I'm sp- spreading one. And then, you know, hopefully if timing works out well with two people, then they're, they're constantly feeding the shredder while, um, while I'm spreading. Yeah, and so that's being done. You know, it's usually pretty cold temperatures, and I'm not running. I don't have any tractors with, uh, with cabs at this point, so... It is, you know, it, it's cold out there <laughs> you know, and a lot of straw dust and everything, usually wearing a mask. And so it's, it's not real fun work, but, but luckily it's just once a year and get it done as quick as we can. And so that's spreading mulch on about three acres. Mm-hmm. Yeah. About and, three acres. And it takes you about a week. Yeah. You know, those are not full days. Um, it varies. Uh, if, if, um, if it's nice and cold all day long and the ground feels firm enough, you know, especially if we're on a field that has better drainage and like it's just the, if the, the soil is, you know, firmer, then I can go all day long. But sometimes, you know, if, if there's, if it's a little wet, um, I don't like rutting the field up. So I like to wait for the ground to be frozen, but there's always this like trade off because you also don't want to start getting real cold temperatures before you've spread. So, so I'm always watching the weather closely on that. Cause I don't, I don't want to see it getting down into the single digits without straw on, um, so, you know, the coldest in the high teens, I think it's still fine, but, um, but you want to be getting it on at that point. You if, know? if conditions are good, how many hours do you think it would take? I mean, is it, you know, a couple long days with two people and conditions are good and somebody's feeding bales to me, then I I'd say three days. Yeah. Yeah. To get to, you know, cause I put a lot of straw on, I do, I do a pretty heavy mulching especially so that's another thing especially now that we're doing uh a lot on on plastic because that that system the what we call bare root on plastic um the the plants tend to grow a little higher out of the soil a little higher out of the ground and we do everything on raised beds also which um also kind of requires more mulching because um to fill the pads but also that soil gets colder um that surface soil gets colder. you really want to pile that mulch up pretty high but with the the bare root on plastic strawberries the plants tend to grow up a little higher out of the soil uh the crowns are a little more exposed um than than with the uh, matted row and and with the plugs also even if you plant them we plant them the the right depth initially like good and deep but but they they just kind of push up out of the ground more and they grow higher out of the ground So, so you really want a lot of a lot of mulch on top of them so i'm aiming for like I, I like to see at, at least five inches of chopped straw on top of those plants. Um, six is great. You know, like, <laughs> uh, I, I want a lot. Um, I really want a lot. And it really also, it, it makes the, the pads cleaner in the next year. Customers really like, because we're doing a lot of pick your own. So just less mud, less, it just keeps the field a lot cleaner too. When you put a lot of mulch on. It's about um, six inches on top of the plant. So your are your aisleways deeper because it blows in? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I try to aim to like build up as much as possible on top of the rows, but yeah, you're kind of filling those pads up too. And, and you keep an eye on it through the winter. Um, if you get high wind before you get any like snow or ice or anything to kind of pack down that straw, it can kind of, it can blow some of the straw off of those, those raised beds. Um, but as long as you get a good snow pretty soon after, even if the snow melts or whatever, it's, it's, it's wet, it's packed down and, and it doesn't blow off later in the winter. Um, but I do, I really like to see 
thick straw and then a heavy snow on top of that. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, that ideally, just, yeah. yeah, the snow really makes a big difference too. And then other things that can happen too that we've we've been dealing with are deer like to come in and dig those plants up in the winter. <laughs> They'll push the straw off of the plant and and eat the leaves, which does damage to the plants. But even at that, you know, just by eating the leaves, but also. The, the bigger problem is that they, they just left them uncovered, you know? <laughs> and so then you get freeze they damage. Completely you get, kill the crowns, too. Yeah, yeah, you get winter damage once those deer uncover them. So we've, hmm. it's a challenge, something that we're trying, trying to figure out because it's kind of hard to fence each individual field, you know, every year. And um, still allow access in exactly. and out for yourself. And deer are pretty tricky to fence, too. I mean, yeah. they, <laughs> They're, they're nimble and, <laughs> and can jump. So Yeah, it's interesting. Um, this last year was the first year we really had a lot of problems with them. And um, we had two different strawberry fields, and one field got just hammered by them. Just all all winter long, they were, they were in there digging up those plants, and then on into the spring, they were eating plants. It just caused a lot of damage on one field. And then the other field, they hardly <laughs> touched. Hardly touched at all. So... Maybe, Who knows? Yeah, I wonder if that field was like sheltered by trees. So it was more nice to be yeah. in, or maybe they like that those varieties. Yeah, better. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> what, what varieties are deer res, deer resistant? Yeah. So then, let's talk about removing the straw. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you manage that? Because that was always a headache on our family farm in the spring. Is you know mm -hmm. tr trying to get as many people as we could to come rake it off by hand. How are you managing that? Yeah. So um, we kind of go at it a couple of ways. So. Um, we we have a uh, an implement uh, a um, a regi weeder that has tines on it um, that you can pull straw off with. I don't I don't love it. Um, I I tend seems like every year I get started with it and I think I'm going to get it just right this year and then and then I don't. <laughs> uh, mostly because um, uh, it's really challenging to get an even straw removal. We, we really don't want to take too much straw. We just take just enough to get, let the plants grow up through because you want to leave as much there as possible to um, block weeds and, and protect the fruit. And so I find that with that regi weeder, you're, it's like a constant, like you're either taking too much or not enough. Um, if there's any variability where those, you know, it, it's, it's tracking with wheels, um, and if there's any variability you know, in the pads or anything that it's just up and down and you, it's really, it's very difficult to get it just right with that. There are other um, tools out there that I'd be interested in trying that I think might work better. Um, some brushes, some like spinning brushes and stuff that I think might be more effective and more consistent. Um, but what we do, I, I tend to like, oh, like this spring, I, I ran over as well as I could with the Reggie weeder, got the bulk of it off. And then um, basically, so we, we hire a couple of, um, uh, Jamaican guys come up work on H2A visas and um, and it's basically the first thing they do pretty much when they get here is is we we go out with uh, pitchforks and and take it off and you know it's really not that bad um, the, those guys are pretty fast and and even in years that I've had them do the entire field because another issue that we can get into is getting on the field that time of the year it can be so wet especially under that straw because it mm -hmm. doesn't dry out very quickly under that straw so i don't want to wrap the field up and if it's if it's real wet out there um then i don't really want to get the tractor out on the field so those guys can usually get the straw off on two, three acres in a couple of days um so it's it's not it's not too bad and and even it, when i use the reg weeder we they go behind they go after me and um and do some touch up you yeah. know you want to make sure things are just right you know, that, that the, the right amount of straw is off so the plants can grow through. Because if you leave the straw on too late in the spring, that's another thing. Um, the timing of removing the straw is really important. You remove it too early and you still, and if you get some real cold temperatures after that, then it can cause damage if they start growing and then you get cold temperatures. It also causes them to flower earlier, which is both could be beneficial or not, depending on your frost protection. Um, but then if you leave the straw on too late and the ground is warming up and they start wanting to grow and it's coming out of dormancy and they don't have light, well, you, you can really damage your plants. Um, so the timing is really important. We tend to be pulling it off in early April. I kind of watch the, 
the um, the temperatures in like the first week, two weeks of April. And if, if there's, if I look at the 10 day forecast and there's no extreme cold, um, you know, frost in thirties and whatever is not a big deal. Um, but, but if there's no like real cold temperatures coming up in the 10 day forecast, I like to go ahead and get it off, especially if we've had an earlier, warmer spring, you know, you just want to get it off there so they can start growing. If you're growing on plastic is leaving some of the straw behind mm-hmm. as big of a deal. Cause the plastic is, is there to protect the berries from, from dirt and stuff too. Right. So that's another thing that you can do with the straw is kind of, and, and I, I wouldn't say, we definitely haven't like perfected this, but, but you can, um, adjust the, the timing of the plants based on how much straw you leave on when you have that black plastic. So if you leave a lot of straw on, um, and you're keeping that black plastic all covered, well, then you're not really getting any, your plants aren't going to be any earlier than just a normal matter row system because, because you're not getting the benefit of the heated soil, which is what we do a lot. We leave the straw on because we don't really want to always, we don't always want to push them whole lot earlier we want some amount real early but we don't want our whole field coming on real early because that's just a lot more frost protection to have to deal with and our pick your own season is it's real important that we have the bulk of our picking happening like right after schools get out (laughs) yep you know yeah if they're ripe the week before well the kids are still busy (laughs) yeah it's it's hard to get the customers out yeah Uh, it's harder uh so but you can, um, you can affect how early those plants come on and flower and fruit based on leaving more straw on or removing the straw. And so if you remove the straw from the plastic, it, there's a lot of benefits to leave the straw also because you're still, you're not getting the splashing. You're not getting the, uh, the berries sitting on the plastic, which okay. um, yep. that can be problematic, especially if it's hot. Or if there's water, you know, a lot of rain, the moisture on the plastic, it can damage the berries when they're sitting on the plastic. So it's still nice to have that that straw layer, um, even over top of the plastic. And then if you have a raw hot year, like a um, couple of years, uh, 2019, you know, those type of years when you're having a lot of high temperatures in the 90s, you know, in, in June, like you're in fruiting season, you're you're happy to have that straw covering that black plastic because <laughs> otherwise you 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 know have even worse problems there. Be picking dehydrated berries. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the the plants, when the roots get too hot, they just they just kind of give up. Yeah, yeah. The season's real quick on a hot hot summer. Did you have anything else you wanted to add about the the topic of mulching? People doing smaller scale. They there are other uh, shredders out there that <clears throat> that can shred like square bales, mm-hmm. small square bales that are nice. Uh, we use the Teagle bale shredder because we're, you know, we're doing, a, we need to put a lot out quick, but there, there are other shredders out there for a smaller scale that people could look into, if, you know, it still speeds things up a lot. Um, but, but mo- using the larger bales just is also a lot more cost effective. So, yeah, yeah, um, I'm sure. Especially if, if you've got a tractor to, to handle them, mm-hmm, <laughs> you exactly. can't, you can't handle a five foot round bale right. by yourself. I mean, I guess you did. <laughs> yeah, we still drove them out of the field. <laughs> And just, just like plucked off them, unrolled them. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can it, you can kind of unroll them, you know, and then spread with pitchforks. <laughs> Sounds not fun. No, <laughs> <laughs> like you said, in uh, after <laughs> end of November, early December in Vermont. It's, yeah, yeah, you're questioning your life at that point, right? right. <laughs> yeah, I am real excited about using more of the the row covers, though. I mean the the. The straw mulch is nice, though, because you're adding a lot of organic matter. So you're at least getting another benefit. It's not, you know, because it's expensive and, and it's important, but then you get that, that extra benefit, too, of you're adding a lot of organic matter to that field. It's true. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a serious amount, you know. Um, and so, so that is another benefit. Um, but then just for ease of things, I, you know, the, using the row covers is is pretty interesting to me the tie par and, and we have had good results with it on our plugs i am certainly not ready to i, I won't be switching over completely anytime soon yeah, but yeah um but i i do i do like it like you said it's it's good to have a little diversity in your systems as well mm-hmm. in case weather affects one <laughs> differently than another uh, your whole crop isn't in in one style yeah let's talk a little bit about 
your overhead irrigation, frost protection, and, and that topic mm-hmm. while we're still talking about strawberries? Yeah, so um, and it's typically in May when we have a lot of, uh, especially late May when there's a lot of, um, a lot of flowers on the strawberry plants. Um, you have to protect them from frost. And even, even pretty light frost can cause a lot of damage and you really can lose a lot quickly. Um, and so, and it's only when they're flowering, um, although depending on the temperatures, um, you know, the, 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 the buds as they're first coming out of the ground or coming out of the crown um, can be damaged at certain temperatures and then they get more and more sensitive and susceptible as they, they develop and open up. So being, you have to be prepared, you know, every year, even if you, a lot of years we don't end up getting frost um, at that time, but but if you're not prepared, you're 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 gonna lose a lot at some point. Um, so we do almost all overhead frost protection with with uh, overhead irrigation. Um, so every spring we set up. Uh, we have solid set aluminum pipe. Um, we set up our main lines. You know, because we, we we don't have permanent main lines out because that's really the only thing we're using it for. And and the fields move. You know, year to year. So we we have to set out all the solid set. Um, pipe all the main line and the and the uh, two inch laterals in the fields and have everything set up and tested i have a pto driven pump um, you have to have you know for to to cover three acres we need to be prepared to turn on overhead irrigation on three acres at one time you know that's so a lot of water <laughs> it is it is it's a lot of water um and so you need a big enough pump um our pump we are using now is it's 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 just big enough. Um, it's a it's an older hail pump. We actually had a even much bigger one before, but um, uh, it can it can put out about five hundred gallons a minute, I think, something like that. So, um, so it's PTO driven. You 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 don't want to run that any more than you have to because you know you're already having. You want to keep your field as dry as possible that time of the year. You're you don't want to contribute to molds and uh, and all of that and um and uh root disease and so you want to you really don't want to run it any more than you have to but you you have to have it set up so we set it up every year in april we test it all out um i have i always keep try to keep uh spare thing you know spare seals and parts and like uh primer like well this year i uh, the the plunger and my primer for, on my pump you know tour and so having having extras of that stuff available being being um extra prepared because in one night i mean for us strawberries are such an important part of our business i mean we at this point they're uh, close close to i don't know about a, a third of our sales our total <laughs> gross sales in a year and in one night you can lose i mean depending on how to, how far along they're flowering but you know there's there's the potential of losing three quarters of that, yeah. you know, in a night. So, it, um, so it's, it's, it's really important to have, um, a system that you know is functioning. It, it's set up well ahead of time. It's tested. And then, and then when it comes down to it, the nights that, you know, if I see a possible frost and, and I've learned to kind of read the forecast a little more, cause you don't, you don't just, you don't just rely on like if it, if it, I've noticed that with the forecast, they can not be predicting a frost at all. It can even, I, the, the, I've seen forecasts where they're calling for a low of 40 and we still have gotten a frost. So, whoops. Yeah. <laughs> so the things I look for, if I have flowers on plants, then I'm watching very closely. Um, I'm looking for those nights that are clear skies and no wind and if if i have a clear sky night with no wind and they're calling for any temperatures 40 or below i'm not really sleeping that night (laughs) i I, you're you're ready (laughs) yeah i basically try to stay up all night um pretty much typically i mean i might get a couple hours of sleep and i'll i'll set multiple (laughs) alarms and and all and and, you know i i have a, a sensor like a i use like a remote sensor out of the field um, so I can be test, I can be looking at it at yeah. the house, but I don't wait for that 
to to alarm me, you know, because I, it, you know, there's too it, much on the line. Too much on the line, yeah. So so I pretty much just don't sleep those nights. I stay up all night. I go out, you know, once I feel like there's a risk of of frost, I go out every half hour or hour or whatever. I go to the field where the berries are because. Um, we have a slope on the farm and I've found that, you know, I can go out in my front yard and then walk down to the field. And I've seen, I, I remember seeing one, one time, a, a seven, seven degree difference from yeah. my front yard down, down the field. So, <laughs> so it's not good enough just to go, you know, step out front. <laughs> I go down to the field and what I tend to watch for, you know, I don't want to run that frost protection any more than I have to, cause I don't want to put any more water on the field than I have to, but as soon as I see a real light, the very beginning of a light frost on the straw, then I'll turn it on. And so then I turn the, the you know, I fire up the tractor, prime the pump, and I get, I get the overhead going. And I run that until the risk of frost is over the next morning. So until the temperatures come back up above freezing. And sometimes that results in a, a field covered in ice you know <laughs> it's like like glass on the on the plants you know but it's the best protection um row covers work uh you can get i don't know if i can remember the exact temperatures off the top of my head here <laughs> but you can get a few degrees protection from row covers um but i've i've lost flowers under row covers uh, especially with early flowering uh, early flowering strawberries early season ones um the, the, you get a lot more protection from the, from the irrigation. And so the way that works for people who don't really know about it, it um, as that water, so you have to have the right amount of water going on a field at a time, a certain number of like inches per, per um, hour, because what, what's happening is as that water freezes, it's actually um, releases a little bit of heat as water freezes. And it's that heat that it releases that's actually that's actually protecting the flower, and so it has to be continuous. You don't want to shut that water off while there's still while it's still below freezing because you can actually ultimately do more damage um, if you don't do it right. So it has to stay on. You have to have that that pump has to be reliable. That tractor has to be full of diesel, <laughs> you know, <laughs> ready and, to go. Yeah, like and some three in the morning. Yeah, and some sometimes, like I said, some years. I, I haven't ran it at all. Um, and then uh, I believe it was last year. I think it was, was it 2020. I think I can't remember. Um, I had a week that was almost every night. I, <laughs> I didn't sleep, you know, for a week in May. Um, Cause if it's even close, like I say, I just, I don't risk it. Uh, yeah. You just have to be prepared. Have you used the, the system to water them in June as well? Or have you not really needed to? No, we, we use all drip tape. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually, it's a, you know, we have a lot of irrigation pipe and PTO pump and everything. And, and we, that's, that's really all we use it for. We use drip irrigation for basically everything else. Um, and, and even where we use a little bit of overhead, like on get things to germinate salad greens and stuff, um, we're using uh, mega net sprinklers mm -hmm. just cause the aluminum pipe, it's just not worth setting up and, different fields and going different, you know, we have, you know, we're kind of spread out on the farm and, um, it's just not worth resetting every time. So, so yeah, it's really, it's a single use system, for a lot of aluminum pipe and a lot, you know, and a pump and everything. And it's, it's for, it's for, uh, you know, some years it doesn't even, yeah. other than running <laughs> it to test it, it doesn't even get used, but it, it's so kind of a, it's a lot of, it's a lot of expense kind of sitting there, uh, you know, not being used much, but you really, Kind of, you really have to have it. So one thing I'd say, um, and this is sort of a different topic, but but one of the reasons you really don't want to be over watering with that overhead is is for mold protection, and that's because it, actually most of the mold infection, like the gray mold, the botrytis and stuff, happens when they're flowering. Um, a lot of people don't realize that until they started growing strawberries that um, it the the infection starts in the flower, not later in the fruit really i mean it can but most of the infection starts at flowering time so so any of the spraying and stuff that you are doing you're doing while they're flowering not not if, if you do it right you know you're, you're doing it then and not when there's fruit on the plant so like i said we're using this oxidate as our um our only uh 
fungicide at this point. And it does require a lot more spraying, getting on the field more often than with the conventional sprays, but, but we've had really good results with it. it. You know, as much as you can keep those flowers dry, you know, you hope for kind of a dry spring anyway when they're flowering and then um, running that irrigation as little as you can so that you're not causing more mold because um, that's, that's the most critical time for the botrytis is, is when they're flowering. Well, if others want to find and follow you and see what you're up to, how can they do that? Yeah, um, let's see. We have a website, uh, Full Belly Farm VT. The VT is important because there's another Full Belly Farm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then um, uh, I, we are also on uh, social media. I, I don't really know how to tell you to find it because I don't really deal <laughs> with social media. I, I know we're on Instagram and Facebook. My wife mostly deals with that. But uh, um uh, you can find us there as well. Mm-hmm. Look, look for the Vermont version. Yeah. <laughs> Full belly farm. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for being on the show. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for listening to today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If I can ask you or direct you to do one thing, that is to go to the website for this podcast, agengpodcast.com. That's A G E N G P O D C A S T dot com. There you'll find the show notes, you'll find links to the farmer who we chatted with today, as well as photos or videos uh, from the call when I visited the farm. If you've got some feedback to share, my contact information's on there, or you can leave me a voicemail, and you can do that right from the link in the description in the mobile app you're listening to this to, so go ahead and do that. Thanks again for listening, and I hope you have a great day.